Now we'll talk about sleep disorders or any condition that would disrupt normal pattern or duration of sleep. So if we define it as such, then we're not just talking about things that would prevent you from sleeping well or it makes you wake up in the middle of the night or prevents you from sleeping. We're also talking about um, abnormal breathing or movement or even nightmares that would disrupt the duration and pattern of your sleep. Now, sleep, of course, as you know, there would be several parts. Like, you know, there's the part where your eyes move, the rapid eye movement part. That's where you dream. And there's the non-rapid eye movement part of the sleep. So in REM sleep, your eyes move. There's a lot more imagery compared to the non-rapid eye movement part of the sleep. You can easily recall your dreams. You can't recall the stuff or the thought-like stuff that goes through your brain during the non-rapid eye movement part of the sleep. So that's the REM and the NREM um, parts of sleep. Now, normally, you'll hear sleep disorder and then we go straight to the usual adult problems and most of it. I mean, even huge primary care textbooks only talk about difficulty in sleeping or insomnias. And that's pretty much the, the most common, uh, a very common primary care problem, the most common sleep problem of adults. But then, your general practitioners, your primary care, your family medicine. So if we do that, then that's no different from internal medicine or ambulatory adult medicine. Okay, so we'll start with kids. I mean, we have to start with kids because, you know, when, when we say cradle to the grave um, provides cost-effective, efficient healthcare delivery to all members of the community or most members of the community, so that means you take care of the kids, up to the adults, up to the elderly and the terminally ill. And of course, a small percentage, probably around 20 to at the most 30%, you might need the help of the other specialists. But that's pretty much how it works. The only people who are excused for doing a lot more adult medicine and punting to the pediatrician for kids would be probably the first one or two generations of family medicine doctors because they're just starting out and most of them are, well, a lot of them are internists who wanted to do more general practice, which covers kids. And um, some of them would be general practitioners. Now, most of them, especially in the developed countries, are working alongside pediatrics, which is all over the place. But that does not excuse the younger ones. You know, once you're third, fourth, generation of family medicine doctors who went through residency, there's no excuse for you not to be familiar with sleep disorders from the cradle to the grave, right? We cannot go cover everything in detail, but I'll, I'll give you, hopefully I can give you uh, enough pointers for you to be familiar with the literature so you, that you can continue to do your own self-study and um, so that you can manage your patients once you start practicing in a few years' time after you graduate. So we'll start with kids. Well, first of all, um, since you're familiar with insomnia and everybody talks about the number of hours of sleep, it's pretty obvious that when you look at babies, they sleep a lot. So it's developmental. You know, it's not eight hours for everyone. So that only applies for late adolescents and adults, right? So if you look at the newborn, that's probably about 16 to 17, 17 hours per day. And then by one year, it's probably going down to like 12 to 13 hours. Then about five or six years, about 10 to 11 hours. Then maybe eight to nine hours once you hit 16 years old. So that's, that's pretty much it. You're, you're down to the usual adult um, sleeping um, requirement. Now, when you talk about sleep problems in children, it's actually very common. So you you will probably see moms going to your clinic since you're you're a generalist practitioner or primary care or family medicine. If you're doing kids, you're maybe you're even the one who delivered the kid and then caught the kid. That's how it works. I mean, that's the ideal community family medicine type of practice. And so you've seen this baby since birth. From birth onwards until adolescent, sleep problems are very common in kids, affecting about maybe 25 to 40% of all infants and preschool children. And approximately, probably even about 20% of all teenagers. Now, is this significant? Um, of course it is. It, if it causes problems with adults, like, you know, if you're 
in med school or if you're working as a doctor and and or even if it's an engineer or whatnot and you have problems sleeping that would definitely interfere with all sorts of things now of course kids are not working so but you'll see the kids sluggish they have fatigue now they can be irritable um it might interfere with their physical well-being they don't play as well as the other kids um, of course they're irritable then and they, they cry easily and, and things like that they also will probably do poorly in school if the sleep disorder is really bad so what we'll do is we'll just run through the most common problems you probably see, see in kids you know the the mom goes to you and says well the, the most common things are the parasomias or the things that happen every now and then during sleep so nightmares would be a common thing you know if the child always wakes up at night with nightmares more than likely the mom will run to the doctor and ask for help it usually happens during the dream state so it's like a, a nighttime bad dreaming or a nightmare the child wakes up very frightened um, can remember all the details because it's the rapid eye movement part of the sleep for a short while you know the child wakes up and then you ask them the child looks dazed and, and scared and then you ask them what happened and they, they can give you details of their dreams night terrors um, occur in the non-rapid eye movement part of the sleep now what happens here it's almost like a nightmare but the child sits up in the bed screams and then appears to be focused on a distant object looking at something but he doesn't see it and it's it's actually an autonomic reaction it's like uh, a fear you know rapid breathing you know tachycardic um, sweating and very anxious and then you can't console the kid you know this is actually more scary than the nightmare for most parents you, know, you, you cannot console the kid and you cannot um, wake the kid up from from that state for 10 minutes and longer and finally uh, when the kid wakes up you ask them why and what what was their dream about because you know you assume it's a nightmare but they can't remember anything so why because it happened during the non-rapid eye movement part of the sleep so the, the imagery is not that strong during the NREM compared to the dream part which is the REM okay so that's that's the main difference between nightmare and night terror nightmare you wake up and then um, very anxious very um, scared and then you ask them what what happened what was the dream all about and they'll tell you for a short time and then they forget later on or some of them some of them actually don't for a long period of time now, another parasomia or, or thing that happens during sleep that really scares moms uh, and will bring the kid to your clinic or bring the mom to your clinic would be a child who sleepwalks or sleep talks so usually this happens when you're coming from uh, the deep part of sleep and then you're transitioning to lighter sleep and then that's where the child goes sleepwalking or sleep talking the child the kid is not aware of what's happening then it's unusual it's not the it's not like they're acting normal or saying normal stuff of course you can guess uh, the most important part here for sleepwalkers would be to make sure they don't hurt themselves because they don't know that they're walking and they can easily get into accidents right so imagine a child that sleepwalks and you know your room has an open balcony or it's beside a staircase or things like that now myoclonus is less of a complaint um, because most most of the time uh, moms don't see it but when they see it they get scared they, they think it's seizures so they're, they're brief very brief uh, movements usually one area and not but sometimes generalized usually the usually the distal part of the extremities but sometimes it becomes more proximal as the child gets older now more common uh, you always get to see this because it's um, difficult for the mom for all sorts of reasons would be nocturnal enuresis it's very common um, especially for very small kids but even when you're around 11 or 12 some very very few probably about three to five percent will will still experience some bed wetting so that would be nocturnal enuresis bed wetting most of the time it's just that but in the back of your mind or if there's this uh, other information that would make you suspect then you know usually you will think about well maybe you have to make sure that the kid is not diabetic or having seizures that's why he's wetting uh, his bed or having kidney or bl bladder problems 
because definitely if you have a, a bladder problem, you'll also wet your bed while sleeping. A seizure is less common. Usually you get to see something else other than bed wetting if you're still awake uh, when it happens, if you're the parent. Diabetes always comes to mind, especially nowadays. Everyone thinks of diabetes. So now if there's a family history and, and you want to double check, of course, it's not the most common reason. The most common reason is just plain bed wetting. Now, you don't need to do a complete workup for each and every case. But, of course, these are the things that um, you keep in the back of your mind. Now, um, they don't usually bring kids who grind their teeth, you know, teeth grinding or tooth grinding. Um, during sleep, so bruxism, tooth grinding or teeth grinding. If it's loud enough, if it's concerning enough, and um, parents are concerned that um, it will have a bad effect on the teeth or it's causing other stuff like jaw pain and, and things like that, they'll, they'll probably end up going to you, the primary care doctor or the family medicine doctor or the pediatrician, and you'll probably end up um, sending the child to the orthodontist who will come up with a mouth guard. Now, another common thing would be, of course, obstructive sleep apnea. It's very common for you to, to have moms rush to your clinic because they, they're looking at your baby and suddenly the baby stops breathing. And, of course, all moms know about problems with kids who die in their sleep, right? So, so they get scared. They're watching their kid and then suddenly breathing through the nose and the mouth stops. Now, of course, this is due to all sorts of things like um, it can be something as simple as, you know, congested nose or, you know, like swollen. And the child is having mild respiratory infection, but the tonsils are blocking things up because they're kind of swollen. Or maybe birth defects or maybe an enlarged tongue. Now, for kids with obstructive sleep apnea, it would be nice to ask if the kids are snoring because it's very common for kids with obstructive sleep apnea. Just like in adults, we always ask if the adult is snoring, so big snorer, and then and then when he says yes, and we see all the signs of altered sleep and problems during the daytime related to problem sleeping, then he gets sent to the sleep clinic, right, to be evaluated for obstructive sleep apnea. Now, the thing that moms are scared of, and, and the reason why they bring the kid to your, the baby to your clinic would be the central sleep apnea, the sudden infant death syndrome. When you think about this um, life-threatening condition for babies, you think about possible neurological problems, heart problems, or muscular problems. Now, other conditions might also present with this kind of sleep apnea. It would be a bad seizure disorder or a gastroesophageal reflux problem. The thing is, if you are concerned enough and the mom is concerned enough, then the suggestion is to get this child evaluated some more by the specialist. Now, if it's clearly just the benign type of obstructive sleep apnea, especially if the the, the scenario is there, you know, the, the child has um, a respiratory tract infection and, and you're thinking, well, it's probably just um, swollen tonsils or obstructed nose because, you know, one, one week or two weeks ago it wasn't there, then you can probably... Uh, opt to just treat the upper respiratory tract infection and see what happens. Of course, you keep a close watch on babies because sudden infant death is pretty real and the moms are pretty scared. So you do constant calling or constant follow-up just to make sure that you're okay. So th those are the parasomias. Usually those are the kinds of things that would send moms with their kids to your clinic. Now, uh, for kids, usually in insomnia, or lack of sleep is not the main problem. It's more like altered sleep phase, meaning they're sleeping right, except that it's the wrong time or it, it, it's an abnormal time. Now, it could be a sleep phase delay, meaning they go to bed really late, late at night and wake up really late in the morning. A sleep phase advance would be the kid goes to the child goes to bed uh, really early in the evening and wakes up very early in the morning. Irregular sleep-wake schedules that would be more serious. I mean, at least for the, the first two, you can sort of predict. And, you know, the, the mom is it's not confusing for the parents. Of course, it's, it's still concerning, right? You know, because the child is sleeping late and waking up late or the child is sleeping early and waking up early. But irregular sleep-wake schedules would be harder to deal with. So, for example, um, he's awake for about 36 hours and then sleep for about 12 hours. 
the sleep wake time would vary from day to day. Uh, sometimes it's it's different, but it's it's the really an altered schedule. That would be the more concerning thing. The the first two probably won't get the mom to your clinic right away, but the last one would be more concerning. Like if you have a kid who's awake for thirty six hours, that would that. Yeah, that's really concerning. Probably the mom will go to your clinic asking for some sleep medication to put the kid to sleep. But then suddenly the kid sleeps for like 12 hours and then the mom's going to your clinic telling you that their medication has a side effect and is working too too much. And that can be a difficulty both for you and the concerned and anxious mom who's confused about what's happening. Now, the, the last sleep problem would be narcolepsy. Like um, the child is eating, your child is playing, doing something, and then suddenly there's this attack of irresistible sleepiness, so that's narcolepsy. Now, what do you do when you when you're faced with all those? Of course, all these things are different. You just put them under the heading sleep disorder. Now, when you see this in a kid, you actually might see this in in a young adult, and the management is still pretty much the same. Even for adults, you figure out what's happening, and that can help you. You might not get it right first time i mean in terms of management or even if your diagnosis is right it's hard to make them go away right away now if it's really bad especially if you're thinking of obstructive sleep apnea or really a bad parasomnia you know, the only way to see it and diagnose it is to watch the child's sleep and monitor and test and evaluate the child while the child is sleeping same thing that you would do with adults so that would be going to the sleep clinic or sleep laboratory first sleep study uh, there you can figure out the if there's a seizure and um, watch the kid as he sleeps and watch the breathing and everything else now of course if we're you're talking about the simple stuff like gastroesophageal reflux or an upper respiratory tract infection that's causing some breathing problems during that time but not one week ago when the child didn't have an infection well you know you don't need to test for that right away you just need to treat it now, if everything resolves, including the sleep problem, then that's pretty much it. So the management is very important. Helpful diagnostic and it's also helpful with the management, the sleep diary. So the mom keeps a close track when the child sleeps, when the event happens, if there's events that's happening, what the mom did, and then what happened. So just keep a good record of the management and uh, the sleep pattern and the episodes that happen during sleep. Now, if you recall the altered sleep phase, like, you know, um, sleeping too early, waking up too early, um, sleeping late, waking up late, or, or um, sleeping for a longer period of time, like 12 hours and, and such. Now, uh, this one, the, the treatment's usually behavioral. You, you gradually move the child into a more normal kind of sleep-wake pattern. So you do it gradually. You, you have a goal, like he's sleeping at um, early so you want him to sleep later so you gradually move um, prevent him from sleeping that early slowly so until he gets used to your actual target time of sleep sleeping later you gradually make him sleep earlier and earlier that's that's a behavioral type of management just like in adults you also have to figure out whether there's something that the mom is doing especially if you're dealing with small kids like babies or small kids if there's something that's happening during the time of sleep, how the mom places the, how the kid sleeps, the crib, and the possession, and everything else in the room during that time. Now, of course, for for teenagers, you know, it's it's the same thing. You also investigate what's happening around the time of sleep. If, for example, the teenager is looking at the laptop before sleep and then looks at the a very bright cell phone with all the blue light hitting the eyes while lying down in bed trying to sleep that's that's uh, pretty obvious so the behavioral stuff and the things that happen around the time of sleep or even before that are very important just like in adults now for the scary stuff because um, if the mom approaches you and talks about nightmares or night terrors and now the first rule is don't be scared like don't look like you're shocked at the case like you know nobody thought you did that in med school don't look shocked actually these things you don't get to see these things all the time you probably uh, would have a mom going into your clinic like just a few times per year the first time especially if you're in a training program that's more used to adult problems and you know the pediatricians are preventing you from seeing a lot of kids then this mom brings you with a kid and then talks about nightmares or night errors the first thing that you should do is 
not to look like you don't know anything or not to look scared or shocked at the case because you don't know anything. Now, what I can tell you is most of them rarely require treatment. They get better on their own. Now, if it's really bad, then sometimes you might need to resort to um, sedating medications just to help them sleep if it's really bad. Now, sometimes it's just a matter of educating the mom and coming up with simpler ways of helping out the child and telling the mom that, um, of course, the most important thing is to tell the mom that it gets better with age. The, the severe ones, like, for example, bruxism, if it's really bad, then you, you can get, you know, you can take your the kid to the pediatric dental orthodontic clinic and then somebody will measure the child's mouth and then create a mouth guard for the kid for his tooth grinding. Now, for the scary ones like night terrors or bad sleepwalking or sleep talking that's really bad, that scares everyone, then you might need to resort to the mildest uh, sedative or sleep medication that you can give the child just to control it. Hopefully not too strong and um, of course sometimes you you don't have any choice and you might end up using a benzodiazepine. My suggestion is you try out the milder ones first before you end up using a benzodiazepine if it's really not terribly bad. But of course it's, I mean, night terrors are, are scary for most parents. Now the most important part about these things would be um, proper education of the parents, especially since um, a lot of these sleep disorders the child would outgrow. Now, bed wetting can be managed with behavioral means, like you know, with an alarm system, or you can use medications like some would use a uh, tricyclic to control the bladder or intranasal DDAVP. Sleep apnea, of course, you go through the sleep clinic. And then they try to figure out uh, what to do. Um, some kids would need their airways to open up. Like um, if the tonsils are too big, sometimes they would have to resort to that. But not all the time. Now, of course, when you go through the sleep clinic, just like adults, and you get a diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea, then you might go home with continuous positive airway pressure. It's hard to use the continuous positive airway pressure, but if you're really having a hard time sleeping, you'd rather you're going to take it because you're sleepy all the time. I mean, it's getting good night's sleep is with that contraption on your face is better than not sleeping well at all, right? So, but sometimes you might get away with uh, devices that would pull your tongue forward if it's the tongue that's blocking your airway if you're a child and you have a a tongue that's big and goes backwards. Now, of course, um, a lot can be done with just the parent trying to regulate the child's sleep pattern, and it can prevent a lot of these problems. Now, for adults, we'll just concentrate on the most common sleep problem presenting in your, in your clinic. You can actually go years with just this sleep disorder being presented to you by your adults and the elderly. And that would be difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. So that's insomnia. Most of your adults and elderly would be complaining about this. Even at the end of life, which I'm most familiar with, this would be the problem. And it's like um, it's um, insomnia because of multiple causes. It's a situational, psycho-emotional, medical problem, obviously, because they have a terminal illness and even medications and, and such. And, and by that time, you can not probably figure out which is which. is which. More than one reason is probably causing the insomnia. But of course, at that time, it really doesn't matter anymore. So at the terminal phase, the idea is just to help the patient out by at least helping him sleep well as well as possible at night. Of course, if you have someone in severe pain, and then and then you take care of that. Now, if we're not dealing with the terminally ill, and we're dealing with adults or the elderly, then insomnia still presents with a whole slew of causes. They could be situational disturbances, you know, things that would cause you to be anxious or stressed or worried. It could be psycho-emotional or psychiatric. Disorders could be medical disorders. The most common ones would be someone who wakes up having difficulty breathing at nighttime because of asthma or heart failure or because their joints are painful at nighttime. So everybody knows about jet lags or change in work shift, like your, your doctor, you're doing night duties in the ward or in the emergency room, then you they change your shift and now you 
doing day duty so that would be schedule shifts or schedule abnormalities or changes medications can obviously cause um, sleeping problems either makes you more sleepy or less sleepy substance abuse is another common reason stimulants would of course prevent you from sleeping and then sedatives would make you sleep more poor sleep hygiene is of course very very common for almost everyone with a difficult job and um, difficult school work right so that would include you guys med students interns clerks residents and fellows the shift work is uh, you're familiar with that you're also familiar with caffeine and you're also familiar with psychoemotional stress like you know you're about to present in a conference or you're about to take a, a very difficult exam and things like that um, you're going to present in an m m mortality and morbidity conference and that would probably prevent you from sleeping right since the causes are many that's the first thing i have to tell you before you start thinking about giving sleep medications and telling someone sleep hygiene first you have to figure out what's happening you know just because it's not written in the chapter on sleep it doesn't mean yeah you cannot do it the reason why it's not written down is because it's like 20 percent or 30 percent of the entire textbook right so so first you have to figure out and if you're the primary care doctor that means you've been taking care of this patient for years you are very familiar with his family situation if you're you know especially if you're family medicine family medicine doctors are very much interested in the psychosocial and relational situations and problems of their patients so you are familiar with those kinds of things so it's easier for you to figure out whether there are obvious things that's causing the sleep problem like again for example you have a patient with heart failure is getting worse and he wakes up at night but not only wakes up at night but it's paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea so the problem is not just sleep right so or arthritis is really painful and nighttime is really cold then he wakes up with painful joints that's that's pretty obvious also or you're dealing with a young adult and you've been his doctor and just told you a few months ago that he just graduated from college and he's very scared about this job he wants to stay in the job but it's very difficult and and the supervisors are really watching him closely and he has a lot of work and then you can pretty much guess what probably is causing his sleep problem now if he tells you that he's bringing his work home because he cannot finish it if he has so many stuff to do and there's no way he can do it at work then he brings his work home and then he's looking at the computer staring at the computer and then staring at his cell phone and then trying to sleep afterwards and that pretty much tells you what the problem is right and and the solution is not to just keep on drugging him up with sleep medications even if it's evidence-based like this works best for sleep it's still the wrong thing you know you have to address the thing that cause that is causing it otherwise you keep on giving him more and more and more until those things don't work anymore right now it can also be the other way around if you have someone with a heart condition or lung condition or even a psychiatric condition who lacks sleep then those things can get worse because they're not, they're not sleeping well now nicotine and coffee are notorious for causing insomnia even alcohol can disrupt sleep now um, just like in kids GERD or gastroesophageal disease and sleep apnea can also occur uh, for adults and the elderly if you read through texts about insomnia they kind of advise you to figure out whether it's acute or chronic just like in a lot of diseases and they give you a, a rough cut off like you know if it's less than four weeks you can call it acute and if it's more than four weeks or definitely much longer than four weeks then you can call it chronic now the idea behind that is if it's happening more than four weeks or happening for a long period of time then um, the problem might not go away and it's not a transient insomnia it is partly helpful and it might be good but actually but i think it's a lot better to just figure out what's been happening to your patient lately because for example the guy who just graduated from um, college and is having problems at work can have this problem ongoing for two to three months before he goes to your clinic now if this person went to your clinic after three weeks then he's acute but if this person tried to last as long as he can um, doing alcohol or, or whatnot just to sleep i mean you can google almost everything nowadays 
and he's trying out alcohol or a bunch of other over-the-counter medications. Even the pharmacist can suggest to you all sorts of over-the-counter medications for sleep. So then he might be able to last for about two to three months because he's probably scared the doctor would order a whole bunch of tests and doctors are expensive nowadays. So he tried to hold, tries to hold off and then he goes into your clinic after three months, then that would be beyond four weeks and you might end up calling him chronic insomnia. So my suggestion is it's still nice to think about it, but it's more important to figure out what's actually happening with your patient. Now, you can even um, ask the patient directly. Like You can ask the patient, what do you think has changed for over the past one to two weeks or over the past three to four weeks? Can you think of anything? And you'll be surprised. A lot of them can actually come up with ideas or things that happen. Um, some of them might not be able to connect it directly or some of them actually believe that that's the problem. And the, o- the only reason why they're going to you is because they know it's happening and, and they don't know how to sleep. And they, they need to sleep well right away because they're already very sleep in school and or at work and they need to be alert in school because they're failing or they need to fix their sleeping problems or daytime sleepiness because of lack of sleep right away because they might lose their job or things like that. Or their family already noticed that it's bad enough and then they told them to go to the clinic. A lot of them actually know that they have a problem and actually know what's causing it. Now, some of them actually want help but are not willing to change their behavior. Now, of course, since you're dealing with highly medicalized environment in medicine nowadays, like, you know, people with diabetes end up getting um, before it was just one or two now they're they're like walking around with four or five different drugs and then you have hypertension and they're walking around with two or more drugs i mean you have to go through the medications and try to figure out whether there's something that's happening with that of course it's not just medications it could be all sorts of things like i said it could be caffeine it could be alcohol it could be nicotine it could be even herbal preparations that wake you up it could be over-the-counter cold medications, you know, the decongestants can keep you awake and alert at night. Could be the antidepressants that the psychiatrists use. I mean, not all antidepressants sedate you. Some of them actually wake you up or alter your sleep pattern. Could be an antihypertensive. It could be the steroids. The steroids can keep you alert and awake and cause sleep problems. Could be something as simple as NSAIDs for a few people could be um, the medication they use for asthma like you know some of these are theophylline which acts almost similar to caffeine could be the diuretics i mean it could be something as simple as they have to wake up at night to urinate several times because they've been swallowing uh, an antihypertensive medication with diuretic in the afternoon Uh, it could be an actual stimulant that they're using for something else now of course for making the diagnosis i think the most important thing would be well, first you have to look through the patient's clinical history and records because you might find clues there, especially if you're dealing with the elderly or somebody in their 30s or 50s who already have several comorbidities going on. And then you look at their medications and don't don't skip that part. And then you go through the history and you'll pick up the situational cues, the things that's causing anxiety, distress, and things like that. A lot more important information will come out of the history and your review of the patient's um, clinical history then your physical exam as far as sleep is concerned and then of course you watch the patient and see if the patient looks anxious and stressed um, if it's not that much of a severe psychiatric problem then then the patient himself or herself will tell you about their emotional difficulties or their distress or stress now um, when you treat insomnia first you have to figure out what's causing it that's the most important thing you don't just give the sleep aid right away because you might be stuck with using more and more or giving something that's not working and then you'll end up giving a pretty strong sedative like a benzodiazepine and you cannot get the patient to stop from using it. Okay, So figure out if there's something that's causing it that you need to fix. Or a worst case scenario is actually a clue that um, some disease is getting worse and you just give the patient the sedative and not even check on everything else. So the most important thing is, again, checking on the possible causes, trying to figure out the causes and then trying to treat the possible causes then as much as possible you start with behavioral treatment it's harder to do because it's so easy to prescribe the drug it's the same reason why you'd rather prescribe medications for obesity or for cholesterol or diabetes and spend less time 
trying to change the patient's eating habits or exercise habits. So, so what happens after that? You, you end up using or prescribing more and more medications, right? Now, if it might work for you if you're hoping that the medical representative or the med rep will be happy with what you're doing and you'll get freebies, but it's not good for the patient, right? Of course, I know you won't do that, but, you know, well, try not to do that. So you start with the behavioral part. Now, patients also would beg for a quick fix. I mean, that's what everybody wants, even for cholesterol. You know, patients will ask, can I keep on eating what I want to eat? And can you just give me a pill? I mean, everybody wants a quick fix or most almost everyone. Now, if the medication is expensive, they'd rather have the non-quick fix. But even so, they'll still ask you if there's any other way of doing it without changing their eating habits now. For the behavioral part, for sleep hygiene, it's easier to do because it's, it has nothing to do with eating, but sometimes it's even it's hard also. So the, the thing is um, you, you have to try to start with the behavioral treatment. Okay, so always tell them, you know, the medications come second. It's important to do everything that they can to fix their sleep hygiene or to do everything that they can so that they'll be able to sleep without relying on the medications all the time. So that's the most important thing. Okay, so what are the behavioral treatments? Well, it's the sleep hygiene you memorized because you kept on repeating it. Actually, it's difficult to repeat because there's so many. And, and you know, just because you said the sentence one after the other in 30 seconds, it doesn't mean that the person listening to you can actually rem remember everything you said, right? So you say it and then you explain what it is. And then if they have any questions on on how to do it or if they tell you that they cannot do it then you help them out so don't just blurt out one statement after the other now what would work better is um, if, if you can provide a way for them to remember what you just said so it's either a printout or nowadays you can even use an electronic info sheet or guide them to an information source that would help them with uh, sleep hygiene and how to do things Okay. You can even guide them to a support group of people who have sleep problems. And it was hard before because you can you have to attend the meetings of those groups physically. But nowadays, it's a lot easier because you have social media. Now, that's very important. You know, like, for example, imagine if I say, do this, regular exercise, relax at bedtime, increase bright light during the day, but don't increase the bright light during the nighttime, comfortable sleep environment. A warm bath, wear socks to bed to warm your feet, don't do strenuous exercise within 2-3 to three hours before going to bed, don't eat, don't take stimulants like caffeine or nicotine, no alcohol as much as possible, no daytime napping, limit bright light at night, and no clock in the bedroom. Okay, now imagine if you're not a doctor or a nurse and you've ha never had a lecture on sleep disorders and sleep hygiene before, and the doctor just rattled those statements one after the other. How many do you understand and how many can you recall and how many will you actually do after you leave the clinic doesn't work right uh, and these are very important i mean these are the most important things that they need to do so that you won't end up giving them the drug all the time and hopefully it's not a benzodiazepine of course um, that's only one list i mean you can see all sorts of lists like another list would say maintain regular sleep wake habits avoid caffeine again exercise regularly but not within a few hours like two to three hours before bedtime we said that alcohol avoid late heavy meals especially if we're considering that part of the problem at least is gastroesophageal reflux reserve the bedroom or the bed for sleep and nothing more so don't put your laptop on the bed or don't do your cell phone work with blue light and everything else on the bed so that's more of a behavioral kind of management or advice avoid lying down in bed very alert and excessively awake avoid extreme sleeping environment temperatures like very hot bedroom or very cold bedroom avoid noises that would disrupt your sleep some people are advised to switch off their cell phones now of course if you're on duty or you're on call you shouldn't do that that's why doctors have poor sleep habits among other things i mean doctors have poor sleep habits because of all sorts of things and some of them are the ones we've just mentioned. Of course, it's also hard to advise someone to do and not do something if you're doing the things he is not supposed to do, right? Because you cannot advise the patient well with a lot of conviction. Imagine 
you drinking alcohol all the time and then here you are telling the patient that alcohol is bad i mean how can you do that with conviction right or um, you telling the patient to cut down on coffee and here you are drinking coffee four to five times a day yeah, you can still do it but it's kind of hard and you know you just hope that the patient doesn't discover that you're doing exactly what you're telling him not to do same thing with good sleep hygiene behaviors a lot of doctors have poor sleep hygiene right of course if what's causing their sleep problem is their bad behavior and the drug that you gave just allowed him to keep on doing it then you'll end up using stronger and stronger sleep medications until you end up with a diazepam or alprazolam or lorazepam in the old days a lot of people got hooked to uh, benzodiazepines and it was so difficult to take them off it why because they work great they slept well and they want it okay so so the problem is not that the drugs are not working the problem is they're working so great that the people don't want to do anything else and they just rather swallow it all the time okay that's also the reason why each and every decade people are coming up with all sorts of other things other than the strong sedatives so that they can use something that's less habit forming and less of a problem later on something that's a lot easier to convince the patient to stop sometimes you really need to prescribe a medication like for example a patient goes to you he can barely answer you because he hasn't really slept for like the past five days i mean you can't even do counseling or a good behavioral advice or education because he can barely understand you he's so sleepy well you know you have to give him something right so the next time he had a decent amount of sleep and then you can do the behavioral stuff and educating and advising later and further assessments later now if you're going to prescribe medications my advice is use the ones which are not habit forming the simplest one that works is better the milder the better the less habit forming the better so it's kind of unusual usually you start with a medication that's guaranteed to work but you don't want them to get hooked to your benzodiazepines now people have come up with all sorts of things like uh, for example the solution from way back especially if you're in a developing country or low resource community would be your diphenhydramine we have mentioned already the benzodiazepines and the full-blooded sedatives now you have the non-benzodiazepines which act on the receptors and so you have the zolpidem and zalepnon what you'll notice is the difference is the duration of action the, the zolpidem and zalepnon would only act for a few hours so they help you initiate sleep but then you can still wake up in the, in the middle of the night so at first you know this is the drug to go to like you know, during our younger years of training when these drugs came out everybody were told to stop using the problematic long-acting benzodiazepines and shift to these short-acting medications well first of all because they're less habit forming compared to the old medications of course the old medications work better than them i mean the people who have been using the triazolams and uh, temazepams and uh, alprazolams wouldn't let go of it because they can easily see the difference between that and the new drugs nowadays of course people are questioning whether the new drugs are actually that effective obviously the answer is not if you have uh, a cause that's acting all night then the drugs will wear out in a few hours then you'll still wake up after the drugs wear out right and then the patients will tell you that the old drug is better and they want their old drug back their old sedative back now before we had the zolpidem and the zalepnon they were using in the past the antidepressants which has as a side effect sedation um, people have been using tricyclics for a very long time several decades ago of course people have been using the sedating antihistamines like diphenhydramine now both these medications uh, tricyclics and diphenhydramine have a lot of side effects the diphenhydramine is notorious for and the old antidepressants are notorious for their anticholinergic side effects and of course when we talk about anticholinergic side effects and that means all sorts of things that would be like dryness of the mouth blurred vision urinary retention constipation risk of worsening of the glaucoma if you have glaucoma now when we talk about these side effects you can guess right that these effects become more and more problematic and more and more likely if you're dealing with the older populations it's a lot easier to use these medications 
for younger people, like, you know, in their 20s or maybe 30s. But once you hit 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and onwards, then then the dryness of the mouth, the blurred vision, urinary retention, and constipation becomes more and more of a problem, and they come in severe forms. So again, that, so the advice is don't use them if you're dealing with the older adult groups. Now, I can understand why we use the diphenhydramine because especially in low-resource places and populations, it's very cheap. Now, it's probably difficult to wean the institution or your practice away from that because the medications that you're supposed to prescribe are very expensive and your patients cannot afford it. Now, of course, if that's not the problem, then you should try those first. If you're stuck with something like diphenhydramine or the tricyclics and you're dealing with a population that's prone to side effects, then uh, I suggest that you put more effort uh, in trying to get the cognitive and behavioral stuff going. Now, the behavioral stuff would be the sleep hygiene part. The cognitive part is, of course, you have to sit down and explain to the patient why he's having sleep problems, and then you have to explain about insomnia and why the sleep hygiene is very important. You might need to explain each and every recommendation. Uh, it's a lot of behavioral modifications or behavioral med- recommendations and they won't do it if they don't understand it now not in the list would be the blue light problem and the blue light interferes with your s- sleep cycles and uh, with the uh, melatonin release so you have to explain that if they don't know the connection between the two then they'll keep on using their laptop and their cell phone and watching tv at night in the bedroom right if you're dealing with sleep problems then you have to closely monitor them because one you have to keep on pushing for the behavioral stuff and the sleep hygiene. And two, you don't want to be prescribing several months worth and refills of the medication. And you don't want them to be dependent on it. Or you don't want them coming back for something stronger because the old ones don't work anymore. And you don't want to get stuck in that problem. It's hard to wean patients off strong sedatives for sleep. Now, a brief word about supplements like melatonin. As you know, um, because of um, the difficulty in coming up with medications to replace the really strong benzodiazepines, because they work really good, we came up with all sorts of things, like the the short-acting ones, which, of course, obviously doesn't work for a lot of problems. And then doctors had to resort to medications which are either prescribed or over-the-counter actual medications, but they're not really approved for things such as insomnia. Like we've been using diphenhydramine for a very long time, so it's not really advisable and it's not really meant for sleep. So we've been using some tricyclics also for a very long time, even if um, it's not completely safe and free of side effects. And definitely benzodiazepines work much, much better. We've used um, SSRIs and the newer antidepressants, especially those with sedating side effects for sleep. Of course, they're again, also not as good. And they were not meant for that. I mean, they work great for depression. They work kind of okay for general anxiety. But for sleep, you really need a fairly decent sedating property. Not unless your patient cannot sleep because they're depressed or they have a general anxiety, then definitely they have a better shot at working. Now, these medications, the herbal products and the supplements like melatonin, valerian, tryptophan, they have been used, and, and there's actually a lot of them, not just these three. My point of view is you can always use the the guide being used in integrative medicine because the, the problem with um, depending on randomized controlled trial is, uh, for example, these medications are sold all over the place, like melatonin. I mean, you can buy them really cheap. And, and then the question is, who would want to fund millions of dollars worth of RCTs just to prove that it actually works. I mean, the reason why it's spread all over the market is is for some reason it does work for a certain group of people and a certain kind of population. My suggestion is it's worth a try just as the non-approved uses for diphenhydramine and it's worth a try. I mean, there's no difference. Actually, it's a lot safer than those other things as this. A better side effect profile. Now, the the guide we kind of use for these supplements would be one: is it risky in terms of side effects and other concerns? Two: 
is there a decent amount of evidence? Not probably not huge randomized controlled trials, but decent amount of evidence that they might work. Three, are they cheap or are they very expensive? So for example, you have some thing that's that has a really good side effect profile. I mean, even better than diphenhydramine. And then you look at the evidence that it might work. Well, good enough as far as you're concerned. And then it's cheap. Then the suggestion is, why don't you give it a try? Especially if you don't have a lot of choices left, right? And um, you don't want to use the remaining choices as far as prescription medications are concerned. Now, if it doesn't work, then you can always stop it. It's cheap right? And there's not a lot of risk of major side effects. Those kinds of criteria would apply definitely to melatonin. I mean, the, the arguments against melatonin would be just fairly flimsy, but they're real. Like, you know, we don't have huge trials and I don't think you'll ever have huge trials because there's no economic motivation for anyone to fund such studies, right? They come in different doses and the manufacturing cannot be controlled, so you're not really sure. I mean, yeah, right. Just buy a decent, uh, reliable brand if you want. Those are the only concerns. I mean, there's not a lot of concerns. And the arguments against melatonin actually doesn't refer to melatonin. Some people will just say, well, look at valerian. Look at um, this other herbal medication. There are concerns of some instances of liver toxicity. And then it kind of implies that maybe melatonin does something. But, I mean, it's melatonin. I mean, your body produces melatonin. It's been used all over the, all over the place for decades. So... If you want to play it safe and you're concerned about those unforeseen side effects, just stick with the ones that are already in your body, like melatonin. Just just take an extra dose and see what happens. Recently, they came up with melatonin receptor agonists, meaning synthetic chemicals or synthetic medications which act like melatonin. Of course, they're more expensive, but that's usually the case. And then, I mean, you, we see it all the time, so um, there is... This one particular non-pharmaceutical, sold over the place kind of product, it seems to work, but then, well, it's not regulated, nobody's funding any big RCTs, and it's, you know, we don't have the science to back it up. And then someone comes up with a chemical they made themselves that looks like it and works like it, and they come up with big fancy clinical trials to prove that it works, and then the FDA approves it. And they say it's regulated and you can trust the dose. But it's a lot more. It's much, much more expensive. The, the purest kind of guideline that, you know, you should go along with the evidence and what's proven and what's regulated. Then everybody will come up with a guideline that will say, well, you have to use that new proven, guaranteed, regulated thing, right? Except that it's very expensive. A plant-derived supplement and it seems to work great, but... You know, it's not regulated and, and it comes in different forms and it's not FDA and so you cannot trust it. And then the company tries to figure out which chemicals inside that plant is the one that's actually working and then they extract it or they come up with a medication that works like it. They develop it, then they fund huge clinical trials to prove that it works and then it gets FDA approved. And then, of course, that's the one that appears in the guideline and everybody's told, don't use that cheap plant because you don't know what you're getting. Just buy this new fancy expensive medication. That's pretty much how the industry works. So that's the reason for the suggestion. You know, does it look like it's going to harm you? What's the chances of that happening? Is there decent evidence that tells you that it's worth a try? And is it cheap? Too risky? then even if there's evidence that it might work, don't use it. Too expensive? Well, maybe don't use it. But very little possibility of risk. Possibly might work. Decent enough evidence. Very cheap? Well, try it. If it doesn't work, then stop it. If you're in a developing country or you're dealing with low-resource populations, I mean, what would you choose, right? Uh, standardize, very expensive, or something that you can definitely try and you're not sure whether the dose is somewhat higher than what is advertised or somewhat lower than what is advertised, but it actually doesn't really matter. It's just a matter of taking a dose and then titrating it two or three times and see if it works or not, and then stopping it if it doesn't work, right? So if you're the safe, want to play it safe kind of doctor, just stick with the easy ones, you know, benign, 
not even as bad as the ones we're using, like diphenhydramine, cheap, and it has a decent shot at working, right? Of course, even if you use these things, again, the most important advice is first, you go after the causes that you can identify. Second, you concentrate on the cognitive, the education, the teaching, what it is, and why the sleep hygiene is important, that part, and the behavioral management, right? Making sure that patient is actually doing the do's and the don'ts. That's really the bottom line. So there you have it. Um, sleep disorders from the very young to the very old to the terminally ill. My suggestion is, you know, there's just a brief overview of everything. Do your own self-reading. Um, you don't get to see sleep problems all the time. So the, the trick is to always have an updated, ready reference in your cell phone or in your laptop or if you're a traditional book kind of person you know a more or less updated book uh, for ready reference for the pediatric patients and for the elderly or for the terminally ill and for the adult patients at least to get you started of course those references are usually by the time they go into print they're outdated by a few years so it's actually better if you get the online stuff that's more frequently updated and then you read some more um, you won't see you might not see a lot of them but you have to be ready when they come in with a sleep problem and you have to know where to review and get updated to, just to make sure that you're doing something that's still updated and not outdated right that's how you do things i mean of course everyone knows like you know you cannot be updated on everything all the time i mean you don't read the journals of each and every field but you know Try to keep up with the most common stuff. So that would be the adult, adult insomnia and uh, things that get moms really worried as far as kids are concerned. And you should do fine. Now, finally, um, this is just an overview. I hope that you read up on these things, at least the basic materials. We'll try to provide you with some suggestions. Now, I won't give you any assignment, but you might want to consider this. It's actually difficult to talk to patient and advise patients about these things. So my suggestion is get someone. You can practice among yourselves, but you know, when we were medical students and uh, young trainees, when we practice among ourselves, we were just playing around and it's hard to be serious. So, you know, get the, somebody in your household, tell them that, you know, you want them to be serious and tell them their role. You know, they didn't go to medical school or nursing school or they have no idea about sleep problems and sleep hygiene but they're worried about the sleep problem and you're supposed you're going to tell them something so what you are going to tell them is you're going to try to explain to them what their sleep disorder is and then you're going to start telling them about sleep hygiene explaining each of the things that you want them to do and not do and then after that uh, ask them to give you a very sincere and honest feedback and then you can try again okay i'm happy practicing